Thank you. Thank you. So clearly a lot of anger there, a lot of anguish out there, and there's a lot of anger and a lot of anguish in Israel as well after that terror attack on the 7th of October. I think we have to step back a little bit and see where is the end game in all of this? What is going to happen? What happens if Israel is successful in rooting out Hamas there in Gaza? What if it's not? Where does this all lead to? Will there be peace at some point? How should countries like India make their strategic plans on the basis of this? Joining us now to answer some of those questions, Alan Burstein, who's an uh, Israel Institute fellow at the University of uh, Cali California. Uh, Alan, uh, thank, you. thank you so much for joining us. Now, obviously a lot of anger there in Israel, anger, of course, in, in the Gaza Strip. Is there some sort of an end game in all of this? Where does this, where does this, this possibly lead to? One month, three months, six months from now? There's a reported end game. I cannot say that it is a realistic one. Israel has said that it is not going to return to the reality that has been. Hamas has controlled the Gaza Strip since 2007, and Israel has carried out over 10 major operations against the Gaza Strip whenever rockets were attacked. It carried out two large-scale invasions. But every time it carried out the invasion, and then it came back and said, and now we're okay, now they're deterred. Now it's going to be more calm. And that sort of blew up in Israel's face on October 7th. So now Israel's saying it's not going to return to that. It's going to go in and destroy Hamas that they cannot govern anymore. Realistically, what does that mean? No one really knows. And there's mounting pressure in the United States also that Israel does not really have a plan for what happens after. Let's say they reoccupy the Gaza Strip and destroy Hamas. What's next after you've killed most Hamas fighters? No one really knows. Okay, so before we move to the medium and the long-term implications of whatever is happening, let's just try and understand this in the short term. Look, Gaza is not a very big place. What, 25 miles by 4 miles, 2.2 million people crammed into that small area. So when Israel is saying destroy Hamas, how is it going to be possible to physically destroy Hamas without there actually being a very, very large number of casualties? It depends what they mean by destroy Hamas. You're absolutely right. The whole Gaza Strip is 161 square miles or 363 square kilometers. It is an absolutely tiny region. And just for some proportion, in the, la in the first two weeks of the war, Israel dropped more bombs into the Gaza Strip than the United States dropped into all of Afghanistan in two years of war. So realistically, there's no way to really fight an active war there constantly without mass amounts of civilian casualties. Now, Israel has called on civilians in Gaza to move down south, Roughly 1 million civilians are now internally displaced and have moved down south, so those theoretically trying to, to minimize this. But this is exactly the question the United States is asking. You're going to destroy Hamas. How are you going to do that? Are you going to go house by house and interrogate 2 million people, ask them if they are Hamas members? What exactly does that mean? Right now, it appears to be much more of a desire in Israel to destroy Hamas's military capabilities, which you can do without killing everyone in the Gaza Strip. You can theoretically take over the Gaza Strip and manage to somehow mitigate and control the, the missiles or the guns or something like that. But destroying Hamas as a movement, I, I'm not sure Israel has a plan. I think that's really where everyone is fearful that Israel is just going in without a real plan of what's going to happen. So clearly there are short-term questions about whether Hamas can actually be destroyed, but, but let's assume it is done. Let's assume that every single person who is ostensibly a, a member of Hamas or a Hamas supporter is actually quilled. The next question is bound to be, what happens next? How do you prevent Hamas from coming back? Um, are Israeli troops going to remain out there? Is Israel going to remain in occupation of the Gaza Strip and try to run it as they did before 2005, 2006? Is that even feasible? So there's a lot of concern in the U.S. administration that Israel thinks it's going to govern it itself. And that really is a return to direct occupation. And there are even more elements because Israel has in its government very, very right-wing elements that are saying we should even restore settlements and go back to the way it was prior to Israel's evacuation of the Gaza Strip in 2005. Most likely what's going to happen is Israel's going to try to pawn this off onto the Palestinian Authority. It's going to try to say now the Palestinian Authority has to take over, it's going to be their job, and hope. I think that the hope in Israel is that like in the West Bank, the Palestinian Authority will just be a weakened organization 
that because it's hanging on to power is going to not attack Israel because it wants to just maintain its power. I think that's probably the hope in Israel, but there isn't really a plan. Israel has has proposed already in internal negotiations three different scenarios. So one was a return to direct rule. The other was some sort of regional government. They said maybe it will be uh, Arab governments alongside international forces, alongside Egypt, some mishmash that's unclear because no one would, no none of these other countries agreed to this. And finally, it was return to the Palestinian Authority, which Israel's right wing government is saying it does not want. Realistically speaking, I think that's probably going to be the only viable possibility. I will say, if if, if I can add, coming from a, a point of view of comparative research, there has never been a time, maybe once or twice in all of history, when a terror group has been destroyed by a state and just stay destroyed. Almost always this only happens if you have some sort of diplomatic or regional peace treaty or something like that, that then, as you said, keeps it down. Otherwise, the idea that it's just going to be destroyed and somehow stay down and not come back and that millions of Gazans that have lost their homes and thousands of people who have lost their lives are just going to agree to now live in peace with Israel after Israel did this to them is not very realistic. That I agree. So, Aaron, in the long term, is there a solution that arises out of all of them? We keep hearing two-state solution and things like that. Can it be done? Or at the end of the day, it's right now looking as if Saudi Arabia pieces off the table. Abraham Accords are looking in doubt. Countries said as India would invested a lot, hoping that there's going to be peace in the Middle East. That's all looking very, very rocky. At some point, do you think peace comes? Do you think a two-state solution comes or some other formula emerges that the Middle East settles down? I think that, yes, um, ironically and very tragically, I'll say that in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, in the history of the way this conflict goes, nothing ever changes without massive eruptions of violence. It's a very unfortunate pattern. But Israel took over the West Bank and the Gaza Strip in 1967 and governed it for 20 years with a harsh occupation and settlements. And it took the first Palestinian intifada in order to get Israel to sign the Oslo Accords with the Palestinian, with the PLO that created the Palestinian Authority. After that, Jordan signed peace with Israel. After that, all of a sudden, Arab countries that had never agreed to have any relations with Israel started to have them. Then it took the second intifada and a lot of violence to lead Israel to withdraw from the Gaza Strip. Now, I'm not justifying violence. I'm not saying, therefore, this is a good thing. But I am saying that every time there's such a massive eruption of violence, it really changes the geopolitical system and changes the regional alliances in very substantial ways. Now, what what has happened so far in the last month, more Israelis were killed than in both intifadas combined, and more Palestinians have been killed than in the last 20 years, or I'll say in the last 18 years since the end of the second intifada. So we already have the makings of like that tragic moment when both leaderships are going to look and say, okay, maybe something has changed. And should there be an Israeli leadership and a Palestinian leadership? You said best case scenario, so I'm trying to be optimistic. In the Middle East, that's a challenge. But should there be two sides that are willing to come together, I think a lot of Arab countries would actually like to jump on that because they have their own considerations. Saudi Arabia would love to have relations with Israel in order to have access to a U.S. defense alliance and access to weapons against Iran. Other countries may want to jump in on that too. I think that they would like that opportunity. But if before, if with the Abraham Accords, Israel and the United States thought they were going to bypass the Palestinian issue and have Israel have relations with the Arab countries, I think this has largely destroyed that option. I think only if a Palestinian authority or entity or whatever is able to make peace with Israel, then Arab countries may follow. I don't see them now being able to say, okay, Israel's now gone and done this in Gaza. We're still going to make peace with it and we're going to bypass Palestinians. That I think would, would be much harder. All right, uh, Aaron Bernstein, that's a very clear outlining of the short term, the medium term and the long term and how all of this could potentially play itself out. But